Coffee with a Chair was recorded before a live studio audience. Welcome. Welcome to Coffee with the Chair. I'm Teresa Aronson from the St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce. It's our pleasure, our honor to facilitate this event every single month. It's free. It's open to the public. We uh, throw in coffee in Danish, courtesy of Steamworks right there on US1. It's a brick and mortar, small business, locally owned. So head out there. Um, if you can't be here, maybe you should be there or ordering your pool from a g Pools, our sponsor of this show. One of the two, pick one. One's got a, a smaller price tag than the other. Well, this is true. And also don't forget, Steamworks was just awarded an award at your chamber event. Tell them about that. Yes, uh, well, first I wanna introduce my co-host, which of course is uh, Kathy Townsend, Board of County Commission Chair. And she is absolutely right, and I'm glad she brought that up. We just had our Business and Industry Awards and um, it's a cute story, I'm gonna tell it, but he'll probably cry all over again. So if anybody, whoever's <laughs> sitting next to Michael, be prepared to comfort him. But we uh, did it differently. We had 10 um, purveyors of food, some of our caterers, some of our restaurants. You kind of walked around and got your mm -hmm. different bites and then we voted at the end. Well, Steamworks, Michael was the winner in one of our business and industry categories, our classic categories for retail, for a small business, he was the winner. And then um, he was in the contest and on the way to the venue, they dropped their jambalaya and couldn't bring it. Does everybody feel bad for Michael now? He felt so bad. He came and he's like, I, I dropped, we dropped I it. know, I, I was in there yeah, earlier yeah. that day. I had a meeting and they, they, they oh, were cooking at, the, at Steamworks and they were cooking it. So yeah, when I got there, I'm like, where's your booth? And he told me what happened. Oh no. Yeah, he looked a little devastated. His chef was definitely devastated. Yeah. I'm sure it was wonderful. I'm sure it was delicious. Yes, but at least he won an award. I agree. And I was like, just sit down and try to enjoy the night. So he so he stayed. But yeah, business and industry, we had a record crowd um, since before COVID. We were at the mid-floor, oh, about 400 people there, just under 400. Um, and how did you enjoy the food? It was good. I didn't really test everything because I didn't have time but yeah um, it was it was well presented there was a lot of variety good and that's kind of what we were going yeah, for there was like, a variety like and I think whatever diet you were on you could have found something if you were gluten-free if you were vegan vegetarian they had a variety of stuff there well um, eating with V had and you and we all know Veronica Kolbab has eating with V which is a healthy alternative to a lot of our favorites and she had two offerings mm -hmm. and it did quite well in the so that's what I'm saying. it didn't matter your diet you could have found something to eat. yeah then she brought some to my office and um, I ate the whole bag of the oat ones. Have you ever had her avocado pudding? I don't think I have. Her avocado have chocolate I these pudding? in the audience today. I don't think I have. <laughs> I've had her banana nut. I've had her um, like oat nut. And Try the avocado chocolate pudding. Okay, I'll have to try it. But yeah, I've heard about avocados and pudding. Yeah. So anyway, it was a great night. It was I'm, a good night. I'm it was, very it was... thankful for to everybody that participated. It was a great way for us to showcase a lot of our members. And also, I'm not gonna lie, it was it was a little less taxing and expensive. You know, when you do a, a seated dinner, there's a head count, you're stressing, it, there's so much that goes into it. So this was so fun. For yeah, us. it was a fun, I think everybody enjoyed it. Good, good. Congratulations to all the winners. We're doing a press release, it should be out. By the time you see this, you should uh, know who all of them are. So if you run into them on the street, but thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. I appreciate Always. that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was there. It was a good night. All the all the peoples were there, as they say. So, um, what are we going to talk about today? Travis Leonard is our sponsor. He wasn't able to be with us today, so we have a little extra time. And I'm not sure what we think we probably need to let everybody know. This show is really an informational show. We do it because we want people to know the things we're talking about here. And I learned something every time we do a, job, a show, right? I don't know about that. You know you know a lot. What <laughs> you think? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna recognize Dave Wilbur out here. Nice to see you here today. And I'm gonna start by saying, this isn't against you. It was just something that just happened before the show today, right? Uh, an employee came down and was talking to me about, she was retired, her and her husband, and we needed to do something as commissioners because so many elderly people that are retired are having to go back to work. And she said that, you know, they bought a uh, repo when they came 
and they were fine. And then about three years ago, they were both forced to go back to work. And so she said she runs into so many elderly people that are trying to go back to work and find a job, but they're only ending up with jobs at like Home Depot, McDonald's, stuff like that. And I said, well, if you own your home and you don't have a mortgage, why don't you self-insure? Sorry, Dave. Oh. And, <laughs> and she said, well, what is that? So she didn't even know what self-insuring was. And oh. so I, I was like, kind of like, I was just shocked that she didn't know that. So when I explained to her what it was, you know that if you don't have a mortgage, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to have insurance. You don't. You can um, just own your own house outright. I'm self-insured. Okay. And what I do and what I've done for years is I have an account that what my insurance would have been, I put in there. My husband was in construction. Mm -hmm. And so if there is ever a problem during a storm, but if you have a solid house, unpacked windows, metal roof, block, you know, and you are handy, how much damage are you really going to have? So over a period of time, after a couple of years, what you'd pay in insurance adds up. So you have it as a nest egg that if a hurricane happens and you do have some damage and your husband's handy or friends, you can probably fix it for a third or half of what the cost would be versus insurance. Now, I'm not saying that's what everybody should go and do. I'm just saying it's an option yeah. for those that are on fixed incomes that are retired, that don't have mortgages. And she said her husband was in construction. Oh, he was. So, yeah, so I said, well, if he's still healthy and he's still capable of doing things, and she said that they just were in the process of putting on a new roof, it was another path forward, another option, because as commissioners, we can't get involved in telling businesses, um, you know, who to, who to, you know, hire and, and whatever. So um, I wish there was a quick fix for that. I wish there was an answer that we could do something, but unfortunately we can't. No. But I, I do know, and I'm sure Mr. Wilbur is well aware, you know, insurance is a problem here in the state of Florida. It's in session. Governor's looking at it. Hopefully they'll find a path forward to do something about it. But at this level, there's not anything that an insurance company or you or I or somebody locally are going to be able to do. There's not. Um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts and ideas, but it, it's troublesome. And even though that we're getting a little bit more competition, you know, I, I, I seriously doubt, and I've had this conversation with some of our electeds, is I seriously doubt the rates are going to go down but if they could steady off at least. Mm -hmm. It is a problem for, for the elderly. I do think that there has to be some other fix. The majority of our issues in Florida with insurance are roofs, right? Mm -hmm. And now roofs, it, they want you to change those roofs on a, a pace that they've decided. Not the integrity of the roof has decided, right. but they as you know, actuarians have decided. And um, I find that a little bit appalling. But mm -hmm. I think that there are some things that you can do, you know, as a state to ensure that roofs can be replaced. Because if that's the only problem, let's address it, right? Flooding's a little bit of an issue too, but not everywhere throughout the state, but roofs are a universal problem throughout the state. Well, I think one of the biggest things that hit a lot of people is in the past six years, a lot of people, when they had to replace their roof, put a metal roof. Yeah. And they did that because they thought metal roofs last forever. Yeah. And so those that did the metal roofs recently were told, well, if your roof is more than five years old, you have to replace it and a metal roof doesn't count. And so there was a lot of people with metal roofs that made the investment and that later found out it didn't matter because- There's yeah. different types of metal roofs too. Mm -hmm. um, yep, they're standing seam, 5B crimp. Yep. Yeah, There's yeah. There's architectural yeah. metal shingle. Yeah. And so a metal roof does last. It does. And but but insurance companies came out with they weren't going to recognize if your if your metal roof was 15 years old, you had to replace it. Yeah. And that was a problem. It was a big problem last year. So, you know, I'm leaving up to Tallahassee. We have great representation up there. And if it's going to be fixed, they're going to fix it. And it's not something I can fix. So, yeah. Well, roofs are terribly expensive, as you know, as well. And um, they want to blame the insurance industries, you know, the advantage that the um, the clients are taking, but it, it's it's not, you know, there's not one one fix, there's not one cause, but we'll see what happens this year in Tallahassee. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I am too. I think we're gonna have a good session. Speaking about session, um, our bill went through committee yesterday, my medical, inmate medical bill. Good. It went through the first committee. It's gotta go through committee, uh, the, you know, the other committee. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's gonna pass. And for those of you that don't know what that is, every year we have a line item in our budget and it is to take care of inmate medical. And it always comes back with eight to $10 million higher. 
at the end of the year that we have to pull out a general fund. So trying to find a path forward, we've tried to say, don't send the inmates to Lawnwood, please take them to Cleveland Clinic. And um, so- yeah, What's the difference there? So the difference is uh, HCA is currently billing us at a rate of up to 1,000% over Medicare rate. Okay. And, and there's no rhyme or reason. Like we, we've tried to look at everything and see, is it just this procedure that they're doing that? Because some procedures they're billing at 300% over, some they're bill, billing at 1,000% over, some it's 200% over. It's just random percentages over different charges. And is that a negotiated contract? Um, yes, it's hmm. supposed to be, but we, but we don't have one with them. Okay. And so, so through the last two years, they have gotten better at taking the inmates to Cleveland Clinic. That we do have a negotiated contract with them. Good. And so um, it kind of goes in spurts. They do really well with doing that. And then it kind of goes back to taking them to Longwood. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find a path forward so that we don't have to keep coming up with an additional eight to $10 million at the end of the year. Some of the suggestions Taxpayer money. that I had made over the last two years was, why don't we have a triage unit out there? Why don't we have an x-ray unit out there? You know, have somebody on call, and if somebody says I've broken my arm, instead of sending him to Longwood that you know it's not an emergency, it's gonna be a 24-hour stay with two deputies. Mm -hmm. They're with the inmate, one outside, one with. You know, it's cheaper to have somebody on call, and if you get that call, they go out and you pay them the $100 mm -hmm. to do the one x-ray and they go back home. So last year we pulled, uh, we came up with $100,000. We bought some more medical equipment to put out there at the jail. Two of the things we purchased was the little handheld lab units. So when somebody needed labs, they were sending them to Lawnwood. So I, I, I spoke to some of the medical staff out there and um, they all knew how to use those units. So we purchased the units, made life so much easier that the nurses loved it because they would draw the blood, put it in, eight minutes later they had the results. Right. So um, trying to still find a path forward, we sat down with HCA to see if we could negotiate something and get there. Uh, we could not find a path forward. So we implemented a bill. Representative Trubolsi has picked that bill up and uh, Senator Garrell is taking it in the Senate. Um, it's getting a lot of traction from conversations I've had with other representatives and senators throughout the state. I think it'll pass. We'll be the first county to do this. And I think other counties will jump on board. Doing? And what we're doing is the bill is gonna say that they can bill 100% over Medicare. It, because they are a for-profit hospital, if they are in a deficit and at a loss, they can charge up to 125%. And it caps it at 125% across the board per procedure. Perfect. So we know that if we put 10 million in, um, we should stay within budget. And worst case scenario, we're only gonna be looking at 100% over the Medicare rate of any other charges outside of that. And so, so the other path forward was having conversations um, with George. Um, I wanted to take over the inmate medical. And George is our county administrator. So I wanted to take it over because I felt like if the county got involved, we had our, a liaison out there located within the jail, overseeing some, some of the things, we could save more money. And so the path forward was, as you know, we were almost there with uh, Sheriff Mascara, he resigned. So Keith, uh, the new sheriff, Pearson, came in and there was a little bit of a transition. We were in the middle of signing that kind of put things on hold. But um, two weeks ago, we finally got the signed contract. And so now we are in control of the inmate medical. We're transitioning over there right now. We have an Good. employee, Alice, that's going over there. They had to make her office. Um, we are meeting actually with Wellpath today, staff is, and I have a meeting with the COO on the 15th of February. Um, to see if we can find a path forward and bridge some of the gaps of a relationship. And if not, well, then we will have other uh, conversations with other people if we can't get there. So again, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to trying to have it where it's more of a little triage unit set up there so that they don't have to be sent out. The path forward I'd like to see is there are medical jail companies that are nonprofits. And what they do is they go in and run a jail and you negotiate a contract with them for a set amount. And well, so if you go in, like you have the nonprofit medical and we, we yeah. negotiate 10 million, you know that's all you're gonna get. And that's what I'm saying, I don't care if it's for-profit or non-profit, so be as long as you have a contract. Right, so because of that, you're not gonna randomly send them out all the no. time. Because you know that if you do that, Bill's on you. 
And that's how it should be, right? Correct. And so that's the path forward we're going to try to negotiate with Wallpath. This is the amount you're going to get. This is just the way it is. If not, then the path forward is we will go out and we will look at another company because we want to set price mm -hmm. so that we know the negotiated price is what it is and we're never going to go above that and we're not going to have to come back and take money out of a general fund to try to save taxpayers money. And, and the reality is, is that if, that if somebody is not incentivized to save money, it's just not going to be spend. on the radar. And, well, no, and, 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 and no harm mm -hmm. to anybody that does that, but you have many fish to fry, mm -hmm. and um, the one that's not costing you is not the one you're going to fry first. And, and it's just, I think whenever you have a set price and that company knows they have to stay within it, it's more efficient yeah. and there's better and more quality. You've got a budget. Here. This is all you're getting. And you have Make better health care. Yeah, because yeah. They, what happens is they have an in-house medical director, physician on staff. They have an in-house nurse practitioner. They can put sutures in. Somebody's yeah. cut their finger. They're not sending them to the emergency room. Their nurse practitioner could put three stitches in. So it's a more efficient way to do business. And see, we can't take them to any of these private clinics because they're private. They don't want to have the, the security risk. So the only path for, for care well, for most of them another, is a hospital. But another issue is from the, and we're trying to change this in Tallahassee. The other problem with, with the medical is the day you're arrested, not everybody is guilty. You're arrested and you're being accused. It doesn't mean you're guilty. But the day you're arrested and the day you're booked, no matter what kind of health care you have, you lose your health care. Mm -hmm. Your private health care cannot pick up your bills once you're a ward of the county or the state in, in prison or jail. And taxpayers have to pick up your medical and dental. And so that's something that they are currently working on in Tallahassee is mm -hmm. to try to make it so that those that are arrested, you can keep your medical insurance to try sure. to release some of the burden. It's an issue. We've been talking about it for three years with the uh, FAC or Association of Counties. So hopefully that will be a bill moving forward eventually because it is something that's is being discussed again this year. But for now, till that happens, the path forward for us to save money is to try to find somebody that we're going to have a negotiated contract with a flat amount. Yeah, I think both are des desperately needed. I mean, think about the money nationwide we would save if we allowed our inmates to self-insure. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, every municipality or, or jail or, or prison would have to have a contract with that provider, but I think it would be well worth the money uh, it, to It'll do save that. millions of dollars. Millions and millions, trillions probably, if yeah. we had it nationwide. And I think once this bill passes, uh, Senator Harrell is trying to get it so that it's a statewide bill, not just for St. Lucie County. Very good, very good. Um, something interesting happened to me the other day. It usually does. So my parents are, are elderly. They, my dad just turned 84 a couple weeks ago, 84. And um, so they, they, they try to know what's going on in the community, and I love that. So every now and then I show up at their house, and they sometimes are mad at me for things that I'm doing out in the public, and sometimes they have a lot of questions. Mostly they have questions. So I was appointed by one of our commissioners to the local technology planning advisory board. And it's mostly technology providers and Trista from the chamber, you know, like I, it's one of these things is not like the others. But I go to my meetings because I'm appointed and, and we were talking about them. And they brought up a, a program that is federally funded. It is a $30 stipend for those in need. Um, the it's it's income based and the elderly can take advantage of it in most instances because they're on a fixed mm -hmm. income but it's a thirty dollar stipend that allows them to get wi-fi correct and um and then most of our providers here in the state provide a thirty dollar um price point option for those people that get the thirty dollar stipend so they pay zero monies for their wi-fi zero and it is sunsetting in April. It's supposed to go away, and many people are worried that not only will the $30 go away, but the $30 option for Wi-Fi may go away with it. These companies will stop, you know. So many people will lose their access to the internet, which is very, very upsetting, right? So I go to my meeting, it's an hour and a half. I go home, I go to my parents for lunch, and my dad says, I, I wrote a letter to my congressman today, and I said, great, dad, what about? He said, they're gonna take away my my, I forget what he called it. He called it the appropriate name. I said, oh my gosh, that's the $30 that we were talking about this morning. Yeah. And I didn't realize that people in my own family, my parents are on a fixed income, you know, Social Security and um, a small pension. My dad, had, but you know, he's in his 80s. The pension is from 50 years ago. It's not big. And so they are on that and that's how they get their Wi-Fi. 
And so I wanted to bring it to everybody's attention, get everybody to write mm -hmm. their letters. If it goes away, it's going to affect, you know, thousands, probably tens of thousands of people here in just St. Lucie County. So yeah, there's um, a lot of people that use that. I was shocked that my parents, I did not know that they use it. But my dad's usually very much aware of what's going on and what's available to him. So um, like the extra homestead exemption, they can get up to another yep. $25,000 if you're of a certain age and a certain income. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. And I'm thankful that I have these appointments to these boards. Because you learn. I learn so much, right? And when he said that, I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you wouldn't have had just had that at the meeting, you might not have known what he was talking about. I would not have known yeah. what he was talking about. So since we're on that topic, two things. One, our Citizens Academy is starting back again. Oh, good. And so for anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's a school you can take for six weeks. You go once a week and it tells you how government works and you get to tour all the facilities of the county, like our landfill, our emergency operations center, it's, uh, our it's jail. A great, it, it's a great, mm -hmm. it's a great class to take. It and is. You learn a lot taking that class on how government works. So um, that's, there's still a few slots left, not many. How do many. you sign up? So Go online. St. Lucie, stlucieco.gov. And then the other okay. thing is like she was talking about boards. We have a couple appointments um, that are open still. So if you're interested in sitting on a board, that's what we do as commissioners. We appoint uh, constituents to boards. I see a couple other board members I sit on out there with the homeless. Yeah. So again, you can reach out to any commissioner and you can even go online and fill out an application and it gives you an option to check whatever uh, board you would be interested in. And when mm -hmm. an opening comes up and we're looking to make that appointment, then whoever has checked off that box, your name goes in, we get your resumes and then we choose you and you become an at-large member. Very and since you brought up congressmen, let's talk about Congressman Mass. Um, so as everybody knows, Brightline is here. Mm -hmm. And if you live near the train tracks, you're hearing the trains loud and proud. Well, you're in the village. You're hearing them <laughs> extra loud and yes. extra proud. So when this, when the trains began with Brightline, um, I got hundreds of calls. I'm sure. And, and I have to say the, the Brightline trains are aggressive. Your cargo trains, have never been a problem, especially at night. They've always been respectful. Brightline, I guess, wants everybody to know that they're here. So they're just laying on the horns all night long. So about two months into it, I knew that we had to have quiet zones. So um, there was just so many calls coming in and I, I, I was witnessing it myself. So it's a process you have to do. Um, I've been working on it. Okay. It's, in, it's in progress. And, and what you have to do is you, ha you have to have studies, you have to have statistics. The county has a person up north that we use for all of our train stuff. Okay. I reached out to him, he's really busy, but we've been in contact with him now for three months and he is getting the studies together. He, he hopefully will have dates for us available sometime around the middle of February. And so by March, we'll be ready to have a town hall meeting. Whoever wants to come will be able to come. It'll it'll be uh, probably posted okay. so that everybody that can't make it will be there. We're gonna have it in the evening so everybody can watch. And Congressman Mass is one of the congressmen that has called because he's received um, calls as well on I'm the quiet sure. zone. And um, it's a process though. And the only way it can pass is I'm bringing it forward at the county level. I, of course, have to have my two, you know, three votes, mm -hmm. but you have to have every city municipality within your county on board. So that means that St. Lucie Village, Fort Pierce, and Port St. Lucie have to agree to this. At that point, then from there, it goes to Tallahassee. Tallahassee has to bless it. Then from there, Congressman Mass sees it in Washington and it goes before that transportation board up there. So. It, it's it's still probably we're still looking at probably a year by the time we get through everything because you you know depending on when everything goes through on our end you've got to wait till they're in session at their end and so it's yeah. probably going to be sometime session of next year before this right. happens but i want everybody to know that the county has been on this we've been on it for months now and it will be posted a press release will go out um, for the night that we have that that meeting so. And where would the quiet zones? Where are you? All the all all the real, all of the train tracks in St. Lucie County. All train tracks, even downtown. Yes. Okay. So um, so basically, there's they have a tr they have a crossing uh, down in, near Port St. Lucie. I think it's they County. have in Walton Road. Yeah, is it County Unincorporated land that it's on? But it is in Port St. Lucie. So from that crossing clear to we get to the line would be a quiet zone then. 
Okay, very good. And um, Angel Robertson is in our. our I was just going to say we have. Congress she was pointing when she said Congressman Mast, and I was like, well, she's pointing at Angel Robertson. I am. Who so is Congressman Mast's aide? So this has been a good year. Everything we've talked about, we had David Wilbur from the insurance industry, yeah. and we had Steamworks and Eating with B and Congressman Mast, all represented here. Well, we so let's talk about homelessness because we have a, another board member here from the homeless. Okay. Um, so we we are looking at a shelter. Currently, when it's cold, we have the cold weather shelter, which was just opened up last weekend. Yep. And um, we have the land. We've identified the land. We're looking at the building. We're trying to put money in the budget so that we can eventually have enough money to begin. There's a plan. We had a task force early on. Yep. The task force put a mission statement together and a plan, and there's now a homeless board. I get a lot of calls for that, and I know that the homelessness is becoming even greater populated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we know why. Um, some of the, some of the things that I've been talking to the administrator about is instead of waiting till we get what we need in the millions, maybe mm -hmm. it's cheaper to buy a, buy a motel. That oh. way we can start with the motel. It's easier to convert, get a deputy to live on site and start the process that way. I am, ha I am happy to say though, that as of last month, Every veteran that was homeless that we are aware of is now placed and is no longer homeless in St. Lucie County. Nice, nice. That's a round of applause to whoever uh, did that. And you know, the homeless issue is a nationwide problem, as we know, and um, the solutions are complicated, right? They're very complicated. And mostly it's, it, it's very often a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that are affecting the homeless issue you know, above and beyond the economy. And um, we have dealt with it at our Seven Gables location. It's tough. It is. It's tough because compassion kind of gets in the way of, you know, I have to worry about the safety of others, my staff. And so it's really, really tough. And well, I'm we, glad that we're working towards a shelter because we don't have one. We have um, the county, the cities have never done this. We, we thought if we did it, the cities would follow, but they haven't. The county about three years ago passed an ordinance for no panhandling. Yeah. And everybody that was doing that knew where the county boundaries were because they left the county boundaries and went right to the city boundaries. Yeah. And, and they know they don't cross that line. Um, if the cities would do it, it would clean up some of the stuff that's done on the streets. Um, and there is some development going on, especially North County where there were some camps and it has pushed yeah. them out. So those camps have had to, f had to find other places. So I think that's why also, there's been a shift of relocation yeah, the with them. Mm -hmm. that they're seeing more people, but they're seeing it was kind of the same amount of people. It's just one camp because they were being cleared out in the woods, shifted over into a camp that was existing and it's just gotten larger. Not to say that we don't have more people because yeah. Palm Beach and Martin County, their officers bring them to St. Lucie County and leave them here. And they tell them we have a shelter. Yeah, I hear that a yes. lot too, that we people tell them we have a shelter and you're like, mm. no, we don't. So it's it's unfortunate and um, and and it is a real issue. Listen, we got to deal with it, right? We do. And and, and again, it, you know, it's a lot of it's mental illness, but not everybody is homeless because of that. No. And again, it does cost us money because some of those are the people that are stealing honey buns to go to jail just to get a shower and a warm area to sleep in. and if you can provide housing for them and get them help and have stuff like the Hans Clinic be there to medically treat them and get them stable with their mental health. Mm -hmm. And then you have career source and them come in, you know, with uh, the jobs and whatever. It's a path forward that I think- but they have to have access to medication. And I, I mean, but like I a think, cycle. I think with the shelter, if we ever get it going, we can save 50% and get them off the streets. I, well, that's a huge number, but I, I'm here for it. I'm, re I'm ready <clears> to <throat> pitch in. And then let's talk about Bucky's. Okay. We're going to talk about Bucky's. We're going to talk about Bucky's. Does everybody know who Bucky's is? Do, now, does I, <clears throat> so I'm going to admit it and I'm prepared for the hate mail, but I <laughs> dislike with a very strong passion any form of barbecue. Well, I can eat barbecue for breakfast, but I don't okay. like it. I don't like the smell. I don't like the taste. I don't know what it is. So I am not quite as excited about Bucky's. I mean, their slippers are cute. I'll say that. But um, I'm not the hugest fan of Bucky's, but I am a huge fan of the economic engine that it brings. Okay, so there, so this, as you know, they were here. Yeah. And they, they did a pre-app. 
Yes. And everything was a go, it was a green light. And somebody decided to go on social media <gasps> and post that St. Lucie County is awful, Bucky's isn't coming, and they've chose Oslo and Vero Beach. Oh. And it was done out of malicious intent. Shocker. So, um, of course, I don't go on social media and really read what everybody does. I didn't does. see it. So somebody snapshot and sent it to me. And I knew who the person was that did it. And I know why they did it. I'm not going to disclose that, but. Please don't. So um, I quickly went in on my page and said, it's a rumor. Here's the facts. So um, part of the reason why they hadn't officially sent the application in is where their land is in the middle of it was a site for a school and the mm -hmm. site for a fire station. So they were still talking to the fire department and still talking to the school board to see if they could reshift and trade off a few pieces to be able to, they're gonna fit them in all within that area. Yeah. So, you know, that takes time, right? You gotta, you gotta talk about things. And there was a 10 acre track that he was purchasing the, the Bucky's yeah. corporation. And that had to fi be finalized as well. And so, that was partly in the, the TVC, right? Yes, and so then that was the other thing. So this property is in the TVC. And we are in the middle of trying to make changes to the we TVC. Are. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a, it's a zoning overlay, towns, villages, and countryside. And it's an overlay that's on top of the, pro of the current zoning that's there. And that is why there's been no growth. It's very difficult to build under the TVC guidelines. It was, it was purposely made that way because yes. they wanted to, you know, maintain that land or or have sort of a dream right. city it's kind of like tradition. a tradition yeah but, but we know that that model doesn't work right. It needs to be tweaked and there needs to be changes so we're doing that so um reached out to the planners and reached out to the uh corporation yep put that up on my facebook and uh, like within an hour the media was all over it and they were calling me and i'm like who follows me like why are you on my facebook page? you're talking about a bucky's everybody okay so i <laughs> learned if you ever want some really good marketing just bring up bucky yes in the old days it used to be wawa but they're passe now we have yeah, too many yeah, it's of got, them it's got to be it's bucky's. bucky's so the the good news for those the people that love it is bucky's is coming their application they're looking to have everything in order and file it sometime next week or the following week Perfect. So by the time this show airs, it will already have been filed and Bucky's will be in motion. Um, and it, I, it's just sad that people have to try to sabotage good things. And also, <sighs> like you said, it is gonna be an economic engine. And the one thing that I have heard, and, I, and it needs to be clarified is, Bucky's is on the interstate and the people that pull in, pull in, never venture off into communities. Yeah. And so your little mom and pop stores and gas stations are not going to be affected because nobody is going to get off the Rio Road and go to the Rocket Fuel or the 7-Eleven to get gas. So it's not going to affect our little mom and pop gas stations. And the other thing that it does do is people know Bucky's and they know that Bucky's tries to have them every two hours along the interstate yeah. for a strategic reason, right? Mm -hmm. And so they they plan their stops and they're also destinations. There are people that get in their ca cars yep. and get their families and it's a Bucky's field trip. And they go to St. Augustine or they go to Daytona and they make a day of it. So it's a way for tourist dollars to come in. It's mm -hmm. a way that the loss of gas tax we've lost from electric vehicles, Yes, that gas station will replace the gas tax loss that we've had. And it's only a good positive thing for us. Yeah, I mean, as a local, I'm not gonna be venturing out to Bucky's. One, I like to support, you know, my local people, but it is gonna be a hot mess of, you know, yes, people traveling over there. I don't wanna, I don't wanna put myself in that, right? I'll stick with my Cumberland down the street from the office. Right. So I'm not terribly worried about that either. This is gonna be new dollars. You know, these are gonna be outsiders dollars that we're getting circulated here. So I'm always excited about that. So good. Yep. So we should uh year, I'd say a year and a half, you'll see Bucky's. All right. We should probably take some questions. I know Mike has the microphone and we have a full crowd. I am so excited about this crowd today. I can't even tell you. So we have a question. Yes, I have a question. Um do we know if the Wi Fi issue is just affecting elderly? Was there an age? Um, restriction to that, or is it going to affect children and families? Because I know a lot of children our and families. It's an income-based. Okay, um, I, I okay believe. but that's not totally true. So, there is a program that Xfinity has, 
And if you are a, a certain threshold of income, they have a program that you can get free internet. Free internet for they, families. And those are children. individually based, but the but the federal funding. The federal funding is what she's talking about, something entirely different. Yeah. We do have in St. Lucie County, uh, specifically geared towards children and families with okay. children where they can get free internet if they make less than 25,000 a year. But this will affect some, some families yeah. for sure. Sure, thank you for that. I was yeah. just concerned that the children, you know, wouldn't be able to do the homework and have right. access to. And that's why Xfinity came out with this program. Nice. They rolled it out a year ago. And they did, and they're not obligated to keep it, but right. you know, I hope that they do. But um, it, it was a huge concern in our, our technology planning meeting the other day. So yeah. don't so don't think that it can't affect everybody in sure. the long run. So sure. we need to write those letters. Yes, thank hand you. Them to, hand them to Angel on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she'll give us your card. But my parents wrote one yesterday, Angel, be prepared. All right, anybody else have questions? No? This huge crowd, nobody has questions. Everybody knows everything they want to know. And even about projects. All right, very good. Wow, that was quick and easy. It sure was. I can't believe nobody has any questions. This big, huge crowd and nobody has any questions. Oh, there we go. We guilted them into it. You just mentioned the question. Oh, wait, 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 he's coming. Everybody at home can't hear you, John. All righty, sorry. Uh, I just, you mentioned projects. Do you know what's going on in 25th Street, north of Edwards? What's going in there? 25th, 25th Street, Street, north of Edwards, on the east or west side? West side. They just cleared a whole area out. That's the city of Fort Pierce. I, no, it's not. Oh, Edwards Road. Yeah. Okay, Edwards Road. Hang it's, on. Oh, I think it's a. I think it's. Uh, I think it's uh, apartments. I was gonna say Edwards Road. So it's by the assisted living place, right? Yes. In between. between yeah. The, that and the gas station. So it's right. It's right. It's right there. <laughs> you can't see it. There it's is, right there. <laughs> well, okay. There is apartment building going in. Yeah. So it's in, it's right next to the assisted living. And and you know I get questions asked a lot too about the surf park. Oh yeah, that, that's Fort Pierce. Yeah, that's Fort Pierce up there by ninety five. It's go, it's going. It's in it's in the process. This one's in between Edwards and um, Virginia, Virginia mm -hmm. and it's by the assisted living on the west side. I, I believe it's apartments. Mm -hmm. I believe. Don't don't sue me if it's not. All right. But I'll look now I got the mic. I throw a couple things out. Okay. Uh, I wanted to mention. Uh, like we might I'm a be realtor. Sorry. So my last six houses that I sold, all six of them, and it's just weird. They didn't know each other, but they all went to North Carolina, moving because of the insurance and tax rates mm. so that's kind of hurting but it seemed like i hear that from a lot of realtors they're moving out of state for that reason so yeah. i'd like to get something done with that but the roofing when you brought up roofs again one of the problems we got is the roofing companies that I go out there and say we can get your insurance company to pay for a roof and i'm seeing it as a 18 year home inspector there's things that are roofs being replaced without any issues at all so and there's I, a, that's, some way of controlling that. They, well, they're they're so they have done that because they've done some tort reform, um, and Representative Toby Overdorf was was very hot on tort reform. So there is going to be a cap for what the law firms and and uh, and unfortunately to some degree adjusters are going to be able to sure. accept and pay for payment. So there's going to be less incentive for them the roofers to do that because what they do is. The roofers get, they act really as their own adjuster and then they get a law firm. And so with these caps of how much that these uh, firms can recoup for their projects, it might help a little bit. And I do know that that is a problem, but there are many problems, right? And it's like, who shot the first cannon over the bow? You know, I got a letter from my insurance agency saying they were tripling my insurance and wanted me to get a new roof, right? And my roof was fine. And then they're mad because people are suing. I didn't sue them. You know what I mean? So it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a, a many factors going into it. But it all seems to be tied to roofs. I think that we can. I think at a state level we need to look at some way to uh, a, address roof costs because you're all going to have them, right? Part of your mortgage. You're going to have insurance. You're going to need a roof. You know. Let's figure out a different way. And I think that we yep. could do that. So hopefully, it's I have a, it's another conversation. I have ideas, but um, <clears throat> don't want to run for any state office. Uh, 
Um, hi, good morning. Um, my last question was on um, the fairgrounds. So last time I was here, it's been a couple of months, we kind of updated that that was expanding with uh, like a racetrack and stuff like that. Is that still in the works and, and on the go? Yes. And not only, not only that with our Parks and Rec, recently within the last month, we have per, we're in the middle of a, of a purchase up here at Midway Road um, behind the Popeyes. You see a large section of land. We have recently purchased that and we're moving our regional parks there. There'll be a new you pool. You approved that purchase? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna be moving the regional park back there and it's gonna be a part of our ERD, our environmental uh, division with some preserves. So there'll be some preserves, some trails, a new regional pool and that's gonna be the regional parks and rec. Hmm. Um, anything else? <clears throat> I'll just touch on one more thing, because okay. this is a big topic. Sure. So a lot of the ag guys out west of town, citrus died, you know, the degreening. Yeah. And so I have been trying to move a text amendment forward that you can have your ag land with a conditional use for storage. There's a couple people out there. One um, has, has a Pike Electric yeah. needing a place to, to mm -hmm. park. Another gentleman, uh, the Maverick Boats is storing their boats out there. So currently under the code today, it doesn't allow that. And so trying to move forward and have a text amendment as conditional use that if you submit your site plan, you have your proper drainage and retention pond and area and you identify the parking spots, it will be an allowable use. It's case by case. You'll still have to go to planning and zoning and us. We approve it one-on-one, -on -one. but then that way also we know where they are mm -hmm. and um, it, it's another path forward them to do something with their land. So that's something that a lot of people are waiting on to see if that passes and we should be voting on that within the next three weeks. Very good. All right, no more questions from anybody? I want to thank um, literally everybody for coming today. Yeah, this was great seeing out. everybody. Such a nice, it's nice to do a show with an audience, <laughs> right? Even my producer, Mike, is like, yes, it's nice. It's nice to have to get new chairs. So I appreciate that very much. I want to thank a and Pools, Travis and Gina Leonard. Um, just there's so much I want to thank them for. Uh, but this show is definitely one of those things. And of course, our Board of County Commission Chair, Kathy Townsend. For and let me close it out with, I, you know, I don't like talking about this, but I'm gonna. Uh -oh. This is an election year. And currently right now, um, a lot of your candidates are going out there and they're asking you to sign petitions. Mm -hmm. Petitions are really, really important because to get on the ballot and to have your right to run, it's a process. There's a fee of $7,000 and up, depending on the position you're running for. So regardless to what party you are and regardless to even and if it's your opponent, I want mm -hmm. to encourage everybody to please be kind. And when you see somebody and you see them asking you to fill out a petition, it's the right thing to do. It's democracy at work and they have the right to run. So I'm asking everybody to please, when you see a candidate ask you to please support them and lift them up, it doesn't mean you're supporting them and voting for them. It just means you're allowing them the process of America to be able to be on the ballot through another way that's affordable for them, so. Yeah, oh, I always sign anybody's petition. Yeah. I do too, to it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. All right, with that, I wanna say thanks again, and we will see you next month, everybody. Hopefully everybody. Thanks.